morning to you. Welcome to Asaki Online. My name is Zenzel Ndevele, and this is the, the Breakfast Club a show where we bring you politics, current affairs, news from the community, and uh, thanks for the feedback and uh, the suggestions on the stories that you think we should cover. And uh, as usual, we bring you all sorts of diversity because we cater for different interests. And like we have already said, our site is a nonpartisan media organization. So we talk to someone or anyone, uh, be they ZANU-PF, be they triple C or any other party, we welcome different views because at the end of the day we want to hear what Zimbabweans think and how they want the country to be governed. So it should not be only for one party or one person to uh, express their views on what needs to be done. And this year is the year of elections. So we'll be having more of these political discussions, uh, talk shows, to hear from different parties and what they promise uh, the people of Zimbabwe in the upcoming elections. And today uh, in the program, we are going to be talking to uh, a guest. Uh, let me say it's, it's, we are happy to have him in the uh, studio because we have been trying to contact him for a while. And finally, he's here. He's none other than Robert Howard Usheune Su Chapman. I know a lot of people on Twitter, on social media, and on social circles have been talking about Uchapman, Tombani, Velangapi, Wenzani. So we, we have him here today to, to answer some of those questions. He is the presidential candidate for the Democratic Union of Zimbabwe. So that tells you that he's going to be contesting uh, the presidential elections, these coming elections. Welcome to the program. Uh, thank you, Sabuna. Yeah, Thank you. So there have been a lot of talk about you on social media and, 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 and you, you seem to be doing well in the visibility on social media and people would like to know probably who is Chapman? Uh, great question. You know, um, first I'll say uh, thank you very much for having me on, on the show and you have uh, been very patient in uh, working with our team for me to, uh, to be here. I'm excited to be in Bulawayo, beautiful city, uh, as always. Uh, big contrast between uh, the capital and here, um, and I feel like here you've really maintained uh, a lot of culture, so thank you very much for having me. You know, a lot of people, that, that's a very common question, who is Robert Chapman? At first I'll say I'm, I'm a Zimbabwean, uh, born and raised in the country, uh, finished my, um, my high school here, did my college in the UK, and then moved to the United States, but I've always stayed in touch. Uh, you know, my family's here, uh, my childhood is here, uh, our homes are here. When I say homes, me, my family, uh, family relatives are here, and I remain connected. I travel back and forth quite a lot uh, here to uh, back and forth from the U.S. Uh, prior to the political landscape. I traveled back a lot. Uh, I am a father of five. I have four girls and a, and a little boy. He turns one on on uh, on Monday. Unfortunately, I'll miss the first birthday due to um, our campaigning. Uh, I am a pilot. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm um, a Christian. Um, so. As, as easy as I can, as basic as I can yeah, say, that's yeah, probably yeah. the best I can so say. So one thing that I, I actually got me interested is the fact that you're a pilot. And I'm saying, <laughs> what the hell is a pilot doing in, in the political area of Zimbabwe? What, what drove you to say, I want now, I want to join the, 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 the politics or the political arena in Zimbabwe out of all places? You know, that's a great question. The journey we find ourselves in life sometimes can be a little bit tricky. We find ourselves in places that we didn't expect to be. So there are fine points along the way. Coming back and forth uh, with my family and working and visiting my family, I continue to see the country deteriorating, if you especially if you look like right, right after the GNU. It, during the GNU, we thought that things were moving in the right direction. Then we started to see sort of a loss that was taking place uh, uh, up to 2013. And then we came towards the 2018 elections and we were paying very close attention. I say we, myself, my family. And one of the things being um, on the business side of things was man, I'd love to really contribute to the development and growth of the country. So I was looking at it from a private sector perspective, that if the government comes in, things change, how can we make this work? Uh, the elections went the way they went in 2018, now, whether we agree with them or not, they went the way they went. And then when the currency changed, I knew we had a real serious problem. It looked like we, were just, we just went back 20 years. Like overnight, we went from uh, what seemed to be sort of stability, even if you look at FDI and look at the numbers, uh, they just dropped drastically right after that after the situation. And I became very frustrated because in 2018, there was a real opportunity to create change uh, that, that needed to happen. And we saw that um, in the political opposition landscape, it didn't seem to be a real serious push when it came to um, making sure that the, the rigging mechanisms or the, that they really fought for that election. 
So the first thing we thought is, okay, if we can't get, as an outsider looking in, I can be extremely spectator and be judgmental as we would in sports. Then I said, I have to have skin in the game. Let's see who we can support. So I put together a group of friends, Zimbabwean friends in the US and said, how can we support someone? So we started looking at the political parties and we consulted some, some key folks. Uh, unfortunately, some of them are no longer with us and said, how can we support and how can we get involved and see how we can uh, drive the machine a little bit stronger in preparation for 2023. So in 2019, I traveled a lot back and forth. I think I was in Zimbabwe six times in 2019, meeting with different aspects and different people, trying to see what we could do. Not thinking I was going to be in front of it. I thought I'll be behind and how can we support, how can we encourage, can we change thought process in the country? Now, could we ensure that we bring international attention to our election process? Uh, even to the point we even studied uh, polling stations. Um, you know, how, how did the ballots go from polling stations, how the V11s were used and how do the ballots boxes end up at, at, a, at a base and, and wait so many, week, uh, so many days and weeks for the results to come back at 51%, ironically at 51%. And then how do we make sure that we protect that? As I continue those conversations with different avenues, I re we started to see the split of opposition. <clears throat> and that was very concerning to me. And I realized we might be in a place where people were too comfortable being in certain positions they started looking out for themselves instead of looking out for the country. And that's on both sides of the aisle. And so we started saying, let's see what we can do. Do we form something new or do we help someone that comes up with great ideas? And the more we continue that conversation, I find myself becoming more educated and more entrenched in this political process to the point that the advisors I was working with and some opening doors and making introductions said, you should really consider being in the game even though I really wasn't interested, I wanted to really just develop the kind. I wanted to be part of development, and then at that point, I said, "You know what? I think we, I think uh, we need to create something and put something together." So in 2021, we started working on our constitution. We came with the same, uh, say, I call them consultants, but they were not paid. They were just there because they wanted to see Zimbabwe be free. And we said, "How do we start putting something together? How do we put a structure, put a, a party together?" And they said, "The first thing you need to have is an identity." You need to have an identity, and 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 that identity is what is going to attract people to you. We looked at our, we put our constitution. We started working on our constitution in 2021, April 2021. We started, so that gives an idea like we're not new. When people say, "Oh, you guys are new," no, 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 this process has been going on for a while. And so then we looked at a code of conduct. The code of conduct was very important. Uh, coming from the business sector, uh, the code of conduct it represents how we carry ourselves in the public eye. So you know in in Zimbabwe, we have this so many scandals. There's just so many scandals in political parties that in a, in a functional political system, some of these scandals would have destroyed political parties. But somehow we continue to support bad behavior uh, in, in, all, in, in, in every aspect. So we put a code of conduct together. Then the next, last one was uh, our ideology. W where are we on the political spectrum? You know, are we conservative, uh, far, uh, far right? Well, we uh, liberal socialists are uh, far left. And the fact of the matter is today we find ourselves at the very center. Uh, a lot of people today, I think, find themselves in the center. They don't like the extremes on each, each end of, of politics. No matter what country they're in, a lot of people find themselves in the middle. So we created that and said we're a very centric, uh, very centric uh, political party. We understand their claims and um, um, uh, uh, ideas on the right side, and they're very strong ideas on the left side but I know there's a medium somewhere where most people find themselves. And so I ended up being in the forefront of that. Um, again, it, my family background has been one that builds communities. My grandfather uh, built the first primary school in Chinoy High School, which is Chinoy Primary in Chinoy, uh, which was the first uh, non-mission-based primary school in the location. And my grandfather was the architect of that in making sure the government put it there. My grandmother has been taking care of uh, so many people when she was working at Chinoy High School since 1964. So my family comes from, from places of building communities and, and uh, taking care of people, and I find my heart being drawn back to that. But it, beca it came as a result of realizing if we didn't do something now, it might be another 10 years, and at my age, it just, I, I wouldn't want to look back when I'm 60 years old and thought I never, I never tried. I never did anything to change the course and conversation in our country about politics. So. Yeah, that's uh, quite a rich history and uh, the interest of actually looking at what is there and, and saying we can do something. You know, I've, I've had comments on Twitter, on, on social media, and people saying uh, Chapman is another Nkosan. And, and <laughs> how do you re respond to that? Uh, you know, very simple. Um, it's an honor. 
uh, I have great respect for the man. He's accomplished a lot. It's interesting that uh, hopefully that comment is, in, is, in a, is a compliment, right, in Kusana, but in some cases you can tell it's not. It's sort of like, oh, it's another Kusana, here comes a guy, um, you know, technocrat or so forth, and I don't see myself in any one of those uh, technocrat, uh, but in, Dr. Kusana Moe is, is, very, um, is very educated, very accomplished, has served uh, in a big way on the continent, on this continent. So if people are using that as a form of way of saying, oh, here comes maybe essentially another loser in the political realm, I think they're very mistaken um, because the fact that they're associated with me tells me that he has left his mark on the political on the political stage in Zimbabwe on conversation about the quality of leadership that we need to have if we're talking very seriously about progressing the country. So uh, I take it as a badge of honor uh, when people say Kusana 2.0. Here's what I'll say about that. The pioneers that have come, uh, that have come outside from, uh, from a Zimbabwe side, people that are either accomplished, have, uh, have uh, lifted themselves up in society, uh, people that are successful, they have access to contacts, they have um, a global exposure. Um, we have missed the opportunity to be led by such people, which would help our country progress and solve some of the most basic things. We've really missed that opportunity. So when I think of someone saying, oh, you're Kusana 2.0, uh, for me, uh, I hope there's a Kusana 3.0 and a 4.0. Until at one point our thought process changes about the way we look at leadership when it comes to uh, our national, our national um, uh, uh, prosperity, that we are always looking, do we have someone that is <clears throat> further connected, better connected, understands the global market, and can navigate those, those markets because they have experience and exposure in that. So it's a badge of honor for me. So I, I get the impression that uh, people feel like you would have uh, joined uh, C and, 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 and <laughs> Being part of them, and um, what would be your 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 reaction to that? It's a it's a common question, and it's a very tricky one to answer because it will look like um, if I was to answer the way I'd like to answer it, it may seem I'm attacking the CC, which I'm not. We started before they launched. In fact, we came as a result of watching what was happening inside the MDC alliance. So when we saw the split taking place, uh, we said we've got to create. A, not essentially a backup uh, party, but we've got to look at this differently. And that's when we started to realize that our politics had really got diluted, where people are now fighting amongst themselves and not really following their own documents or their own um, sort of foundational principles that they had created, which people had really followed. And I thought it was extremely shameful. Yeah. yeah, so we did extend an olive branch even after the launch. And people came and said, how come you, haven't, you didn't join CCC? And we said, we have communicated with them. And if you look carefully, there obviously is an uh, article everyone asks me about with the former SG when we met briefly. So we have communicated with them. Uh, we have, before the, even before there were even CCC, we'd been already planning to launch. So I think the other question that should come is on the flip side. Have they made an attempt to also reach out to other opposition parties? So if we're saying that everyone should just always go to them for permission, then I think we're diluted in what we consider as a progressive politics in our country. I think we're, then, we, then we're not really progressive or we're not democratic in the process. Have they extended out to come and say, hey, we would like to talk to you about an opportunity for us to work together to deliver the change that we need? Um, so it's not just a one direction that everyone should be going that direction and asking questions. The question should then be posed to them is, have you guys made an attempt to even reach out to other political parties? There's two female, uh, well, there's several female-led political parties, but there's two that have popped out in this election. Very progressive women, very smart individuals, very accomplished individuals. You know, when I think of the other two led parties, have, have the, the, the CCC also reached out to them and said, you know, we would love to see how we can form. The question is, we don't know. But the assumption is everyone should just go that direction. I think it's misguided. But we did make an attempt, and uh, we did it uh, more, more than once. And we still find ourselves where we are, which is, which is completely fine. We've, we've got our own map and our own direction that is going to lead us to the election. And if, it's, if it hasn't been evident, it's very evident that in the short time frame from our announcement, it's very obvious that we have been planning for a while just from the exposure that's there now. We've bypassed so many people uh, to get to the point where we are now saying, OK, this might really be a real contender in the election. So it wasn't something we just said we woke up one morning and threw in, in, in the bag. Uh, we have a very detailed plan on how we 
intend to execute over the next few months. So when it comes to if, uh, the candidates, if you look at uh, different political parties, they, there's also this view that uh, if you, um, the opposition um, parties uh, actually lose to, 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 to the ruling party because they divide the vote. What's your take on that? No, I think it's, um, I think it's absolutely, if you're looking at the numbers and not looking at the context, it will look like that. But the problem is opposition, uh, let's, let's stay away from the, the ruling party for a second uh, because uh, that's, the, that's the machine we're trying to change. This is the machine we're trying to remove uh, in the country for the country to progress. Let's look at the history of opposition politics. The amount of splits on personalities, not for the people, there's personalities that come in and the level of accusation that goes back and forth all the way back, we'd look at even people like tonight BT have been accused of being CIO. We've got so many people just accused and so many of these splits take place inside the opposition without any outside sort of influence. I don't think we've matured in that side of, that, of those politics. So saying you're splitting the votes, they do it amongst themselves. They create the disparity that's in there. So it's interesting when we saw the attacks come towards, uh, towards, for, for, towards DUZ and myself, um, we knew it was going to be opposition first. We actually planned on it. We just didn't think it would be that early. We thought we had to work a little bit harder to get it done, but a 45 minute press conference and a two minute video online sent the whole thing into a spin. So we knew very quickly that uh, maybe this thing is not as strong as it seems. Uh, so for us, they create that disparity in their own. What would have been great and would have showed unity if they came and said, hey, congratulations. We're glad that another party has formed, which shows that people are hungry. That if this party launched, they believe that they are able to attract a certain group of people. And that's where we find each other. Do we have a common goal? The common goal is we need to change government. We need to have change in our government to create prosperity and create progress in our, in our nation. But then when you're attacking someone else that sees a space and saying, no, you can't be part of that, then I think we've lost it. But that has been the history of that politics, which is very unfortunate. We'll be having elections in about uh, f uh, five months, maybe later. And uh, yeah, you, you said you've been there, you've launched a political party. Um, as DUZ, uh, do you think you've been in a position to field uh, in all the constituencies and all the words? Um, to say 100%, the answer would, uh, in being honest, would be no. Now, the, we have uh, on data in each province and in each constituency, each ward, Excuse me. We know where we can where we can participate and what the rate of win, uh, the win rate would be, and so the, the, now this <laughs> this analysis was done prior to December, and December is unique because uh, we now know the situation of the forty thousand dollars, the you know three hundred thousand, and the five hundred thousand dollars that everyone seemed to just enjoy uh, the coppers while people were starving during the holiday season. So it made, it opened up the floodgates to say, well, everyone's taking money now, so we can really contend and show people that the corruption is no longer just one-sided, it's on everyone's involved in, 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 in state corruption now. So uh, for us, we intend to uh, field candidates in areas we know is going to make an impact, now, not just in this election, but really as a springboard also into 2028 and, and further on. So our goal is just is beyond this election, but there are areas we know that if we contest, we would win. We know that for a fact. People are just, uh, either they've been led by uh, ZANU-PF in their constituencies, in their wards, and there's no progress, or they've been led by uh, either MDC or CCC or any other opposition independent, and there's no progress either. The story is the same. People are not seeing progress. So we know we can contend in areas that might have larger populations and, uh, and win. And then over the next five years, uh, in areas that we may have no chance of winning, that would be really strongholds and are clearly known to be strongholds, we may not put too much emphasis on those in this uh, election. But by demonstrating that we can uh, go through service delivery and deliver results in tw out of 2023 in key areas, we know that 2028 will then grow in, uh, with an agenda to really be uh, a majority in parliament as well. So you, you are in it for, for a long haul, Correct. not just now? Yes, we, yeah, this is not um, a uh, six month project. This is, a, this is in for the long haul. Um, so we, this is why we put our documents and our foundation in order. Uh, so there's, we even have uh, teams around the country now, from a, a provincial level, constituency level, uh, down to even distri with district constituency, and in some areas we're down to the ward level, where we have, like I said, we've been working on this for quite some time. And so this is far greater than me. I would love to see this, um, to see the Democratic Union in Zimbabwe progress 
uh, even after I've stepped out of, uh, of trying, you know, in effort to serve my country. I, I get uh, to, to be interested when you talk about the teams and the provincial and the, 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 the ward and the district, because uh, there's this talk about how are you going to win without the structures? <laughs> and it seems politics is the structures. Yeah. And, and, and uh, so what you're saying here is you are there, you, you have the people on the ground, you, you, you are a party that is ready to contest the elections. We are. Uh, so we're not perfect, right? So it, it's interesting when people ask questions questions about that. Sometimes you, you have to be very cautious on how much information goes out. I believe in institu institutional organizations, uh, which is why for us running in government is very important. So if, in order for us to demonstrate that, we have to do the same thing in our party. So there is uh, uh, essentially what people call structures. There are teams in place, even from advisory. I don't make a decision on my own. Uh, there are, uh, every province has a leader, every district has a leader. Uh, that manages those areas. It's not me that goes in and then tells that district what to do. That district invites me or, or the province invites me, and then they introduce me and say, no, you, we live here, but as someone that has been re representing you and talking to you, uh, this is the leader that uh, is going to be leading us. And then the people can choose whether uh, I'm that right leader or not, and for their own communities as well. So we do have those teams in place. Um, we will be showing that over the next, uh, between now and, 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 the, and the election. People will quickly see like, okay, these guys have actually got the teams and structures in place uh, that are there. But if we come out and say, oh, here's our list of people, here's everything there. I think with the uh, political violence that historically Zimbabwe seems to face, we would also put people at risk uh, of being victimized um, by simply being careless about putting their names out. But uh, the other side of the structures, is an, is an organizational mechanism for us to move forward and penetrate certain areas and, and garner votes, right, and garner uh, favor in the elections. But the real part, I believe, that would win the election is being on the ground and, work, and going to where people are and working with them and really uh, helping them understand that they might be discouraged with the uh, political landscape, whether it's voter apathy, they're not taking the initiative to go register to vote, uh, they don't want to participate anymore because they see how toxic it's become and how polarized it's become. I think that that message of encouraging people that, no, you, this, this ball is actually in your court. You have responsibility and you have an opportunity uh, to really make a difference in the country. I believe that's really what's going to win the hearts and minds of people. I don't think the people that don't have water, that don't have electricity, they don't have a hospital to go to, their children are in schools that, uh, where there's no uh, formal classrooms, teachers are not getting paid, Policemen are not getting paid well. I don't think they really care how structured and how well organized, uh, how many people do we have in our structures. They want to understand, can you bring the change that we need? Can your team bring the change that we need? And that's what will win the, win the election, I believe. You, you are in Bulawayo here, and um, would you be uh, expecting you to, to have a rally, a meeting while you are here? Yes, absolutely. We have one coming up very soon, and you're invited. You'll see uh, the question you just asked, you'll see like, oh, there is a team, there are people. Uh, so we have one and we intend to come back uh, more than once. And so we have teams uh, here in Bulawayo, we've got uh, teams in, uh, in Matt South, Matabella and North, uh, we've got those. But um, I encourage you to come to uh, one of our, and anyone really is invited uh, to come to one of our meetings, uh, gatherings and see what we are talking about. But we do, we do intend to continually um, uh, push our political agenda. Uh, like I said, when we started, one of our aims is to make sure that we give every political party a right to sell themselves to the people and let the people divide, uh, decide. So definitely we will we'll be there. <laughs> Thank you. We'll live stream for people to <laughs> make their own uh, decisions. decisions. The, the, there's the issue of uh, voter registration, that uh, mm -hmm. uh, people are not registering to vote in their numbers. There are a large number of people that are not registering to vote. Do we have any exercise to encourage people to register to vote? We do. Uh, we really do. <clears throat> you know, I think I, I read somewhere that Zek is getting ready to do another mobile, uh, another mobile um, exercise, getting people registered to vote. So there's two sides to that coin, uh, right? So we've got one where the system itself is providing the opportunity for people to register to vote. Then there's another side where the political parties are encouraging or have messages, hopefully not polarizing, uh, which seems to be the case, but messages that really encourage people that they do have the capacity to create change. So even if we look inside the media spectrum, we're seeing people saying, oh, this thing's already rigged, it's over, this thing's done. That creates voter apathy. The other side of it is when they see sort of opposition attacking each other, or they see that there's no unity. They see that there's sort of like one-upmanship or um, you know, sort of messiah or celebrity status of, of politics that one person can change this whole thing. 
And people are just like, people are not, are not that dumb. They're very smart no, to know that no one person or entity can really make this change. They needs to be sort of a unified front. If we have the right messaging, people will come out in their numbers to vote. The problem is people are just saying, you know what? This thing is, hasn't worked in a long time. It's never worked. It's never going to change. Why would I bother go stand in line and register, and, uh, and register myself to vote? It, it, you know, this thing's already rigged. I'm hearing that this thing's already done. It's rigged. It's over. It creates huge uh, problems in the message. So when it comes to registration exercise, uh, one of those is for me to be on the forefront. I saw even uh, some MPs have taken really that into their own hands, and they're walking door to door. We'll be doing that uh, here in Bulawayo tomorrow. We'll be walking door to door and talking to people, sharing message. The key of registering to vote has become diluted where people think registering to vote means that you've already selected your party. It doesn't. Registering to vote just says that you've taken the first initiative, the first step, and then over the next four to five months, maybe have an open mind and start looking at different political parties and different aspects. And even if you said, you know, I'm not interested in the presidential part of it, but I'm registering to vote because I want to know who my counselor is going to be. I want to know who my MP is going to be. If you only focused on those two, you would have done a great service to your community and to yourself. So registering to vote is the first step uh, that we encourage citizens to take. You don't have to make a decision when you register to vote. You just go and say, I want to register. You have your, your paperwork in, in order. You keep, uh, keep your slip with the, with the code on there. Continually verify that, you're in the, you, you, that not, no other rigging mechanisms have gone in place, particularly this limitation uh, stuff that's happening. And you're in, you know where your uh, voting uh, polling station is going to be. But it's very important that we, we share that message with folks. The one message that I would like to leave with people when it comes to registering to vote is, in a lifetime, you only have maybe at best 10 elections that you might participate in. From the time you say 18 to, you know, to, uh, to 68 or 58, you have maybe once every five years. If you miss the opportunity to engage in this election, if you're 23 years old, the next time you do, you'll be 28, 28 years old, meaning you'll probably be married and most likely have a child. So whatever happens during that in the next five years would have been a result of non-participation in this election, and you'd have missed the opportunity. So imagine right now the healthcare system. You get married, and you, you have a child. They'll be born in the healthcare system that you didn't participate to change in this election, in tw and you have to wait till 2028 to make that change. So it's very important we share the message that, no, you have responsibility. Uh, you have the opportunity uh, to participate in, the, in this election. All we ask is take the first step, let's get, uh, help you register to vote. Uh, and once you get registered, just have an open mind about the political parties and the people that you need to engage with and go from there. As a presidential candidate, what is your message to the people of Zimbabwe? What's new, uh, what's something new that you're bringing? Uh, for us, we have three pillars. We kept it very, very simple. The Democratic Union of Zimbabwe is built on three pillars. Uh, the first one is prosperity. And prosperity does, is not just... Uh, uh, wealth and money, money generation. Uh, no, prosperity is fulfilling this in, 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 as, from a national standpoint as an individual. Some people want to be farmers. Some people want to have uh, land they can leave uh, for their, for their uh, families. Some people want to ensure that uh, their kids uh, the, go to college for the first time or have access to, uh, to, uh, to uh, participate in other uh, global markets. Job creation is, going to, is the forefront of that for us. <clears throat> we have to get our country working again. And we're not talking about giant, uh, crazy projects that we've heard of, uh, you know, some you know, rail projects, we've heard of all these things. Anyone that's ever worked in a big project knows that though, just getting the deal done is longer than the first term of any president. So they don't make sense. Right now, where we sit, our uh, prosperity message is gonna be around industrialization. You know, we want to increase the formal sector. We have to create jobs, and not just any jobs. We want to make sure those jobs have livable wage. And livable wage means that you can send your kid to school, you can put food on the table, you can pay for electricity, you can pay for water, you can buy a home and have title deeds uh, to your, you know, and have, and have you know, uh, title deeds to your property. So prosperity is a big part for us is we have to get our country working again. Right now, the unemployment rate is, is, is just, the number is just astronomical. It's, it doesn't even make sense. The informal sector is now the sort of the bedrock and foundation of our economy. It's 80% of our economy the informal sector. But if you talk to them, they'll tell you, no, I don't want to do this for 20 years. I don't want to be on the, on the side of the road for 20 years. I would rather have a job. So let's go back and open up our CSCs, our butter plants. Let's go back and open up our uh, manufacturing hubs. We sit center of, of Sadak. We should be uh, shipping and in, uh, involved in logistics from products made in Zimbabwe. Second pillar for us is justice. This is the glue 
to our country. We don't have a functional judicial system. Right now, as we're speaking, Job Sikala is incarcerated without any trial or bail. Just two, what, 36 hours ago, another corrupt uh, 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 civil servant was let go, and we've got someone, a member of parliament, uh, in, you know, an active member of parliament who's been incarcerated. But on this side, we've got someone with illicit uh, corruption uh, that doesn't seem to be investigated thoroughly, uh, walks scot free. That creates a problem for us on the international platform. But internally, it means that we can't even trust our own system. So the judicial process is what's going to keep the glue of prosperity, meaning whatever you're, you've worked hard to earn, you get to keep because there's a judicial process that allows you to protect those assets. The trust between citizen and government is so deteriorated in our country uh, that our, for us, that's where on our presidential, uh, uh, for our executive branch, the judicial uh, branch is going to be the greatest work I think we ever do in this country because it allows us then to then focus on the third pillar as well, which is modernization. When we're talking about modernization, we're talking about building, building our infrastructure. We're talking about restructuring our national debt. We're talking about being able to put uh, electricity, which is a big functional part of the economy, and making sure that we're uh, enhancing our country, uh, our, road, our roadways, our pathways. So we're talking about being manufacturing. We have to have roads that, are, that trucks and, and vehicles can travel on. But no one will ever invest or trust or put money in, whether it's our own Zimbabweans in the diaspora, our Zimbabweans here in country, and foreign direct investment, if we don't have a functional judicial system. No matter how good our plans are, if we don't have a system that people can trust of accountability, we won't be able to modernize or create what we consider real prosperity in the country. So for us, what's different is it's very simple. We have three pillars, prosperity, justice, and modernization. Number one goal, a country needs to work again. We need to get jobs, we get our job markets back, and we're building Zimbabwe for Zimbabweans first. Uh, the campaigning uh, mm -hmm. at the presidential level, you're up and down, it's quite costly, it's expensive. It is. You know, how do you intend to fund your, your campaign? So uh, a lot of that uh, so far has been uh, uh, personal. <laughs> We've I've personally funded this, uh, uh, this machine uh, that is, is running right now, and it's, it is very expensive. Uh, that we're going there. But I am proud to say that our team members have not required much as far as, um, you know, right now there's, uh, there's no one on salary in our party. Everyone is volunteering, which is the way that it should be. No one is taking any sort of payment uh, in our party. So everyone that we see as we travel the country and you're seeing as we move around, they're all uh, doing it because they really want to see change the country. And they're all, all saying that we don't see uh, change coming from one side. We don't see change coming from one side. Let's uh, focus here. So um, right now it's been personally funded. I know that some people have came to us and said, hey, I would like to back you. We're very careful about where the money comes from. In politics, you have to be, uh, not just from a legal standpoint, but someone who also is in business, nothing is free. So you have to be very careful where the money is coming from and who you're, and who you're sort of <clears throat> hitched to, where your where your trail is hitched to. But for now, uh, we've been moving very, very... Um, uh, very, we've been very thrifty. We've been very uh, uh, financially uh, focused because uh, I'm 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 the bigger biggest part of that uh, of that process. So I've been funding it myself. It's it's been a huge financial burden for sure. Would you be really, would you be interested you know in working with other political parties if they were to approach you and say uh, let's form an, an alliance, let's work together? Would you be open to that? Yeah, and <clears throat> that question is easy to answer because. We already had one endorsement from, as I mentioned, the man I respect and his team that I respect very much, uh, Dr. Nkosanamoy and the and the uh, and APA. They already they endorsed us the very next day. I was surprised it was that quick, and I was very glad it was because it gave us a little bit of street credit uh, in the political realm. Uh, but the answer is yes. Um, I think there are brilliant minds around the country, and if we're really being honest and we think about what we're trying to do, uh, we are going against a very big task here. I don't think any one entity or any one individual can do it on their own. I think there needs to be a, um, there needs to be a, a coalition that is formed somewhere. <clears throat> Here's something I'll end with this one. If we look on the, on the political spectrum um, and where, if we could change the way we think about politics, I believe if we pulled people from different, different aspects of life, whether you know, you know, our different uh, tribes, we pull people from different uh, race, uh, religion, and so forth. We pulled ourselves, Zimbabwean, we pull ourselves into a room and we looked at everything that we wanted, we would agree on 80% of the items, right? So we want 
functional schools, we want functional uh, a health system, we want jobs, we want to have a banking system, a financial sector that works, we want to be able to have um, a police and national security, uh, we want to be able to have uh, rehabilitation centers that take care of uh, folks that need it and other areas where there might be uh, for disabled. We can agree on 80%. What happens is there's another 10% that we'll never see eye to eye on. Even you and I right now, if we're having a dialogue, there's gonna be some areas we'll probably never agree on, and it's 10%. Then there's another 10% that is negotiable. We say, okay, fine, I'll compromise in this area. The problem in our conversation is we don't look at the 80% we agree on to say, how do we make this move forward? Or even look at the 10% of negotiation. We spend all the time with the 10% we'll never see eye to eye on, and we miss out on the greatest opportunity of building inside that 80%. And so for us, when we talk about coalition, people are thinking that we have to ad 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 adhere to 100% of everything. No, 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 no. Let's find our common areas of ground and say, okay, if we're looking for change, what does that look like? And here's the 80% of the change that we need. Let's not look at the, if we, once we know that we don't agree on these things and never will, that's okay. Because that's not the majority, that's okay. Then we negotiate the other 10% that attract other people to come into the same, into the same line. So yeah, I believe that they need to be one. We've seen it work before. In 2008, we saw a coalition work. What we did fail to do is make sure we failed to really protect the vote and, and have um, regional support in transition of power. But that's another conversation for another time. Yeah, finally, my question is, uh, <clears throat> what would be a free and fair election look like for you? <laughs> uh, I don't think we have time to discuss that. Because that's, that's, that's a big one, right? So I think we're late um, uh, to the conversation of free and fair election. Uh, when it comes to looking at the system, and this is the part that's disappointing. Over the last, since the last election, we have not seen reforms put in. People say there are reforms put in in parliament. Right now we've seen things like the PVO bill, you know, we've seen things going through, and you're wondering where are these MPs, where are these people we've got? We know who's in and who's not, for us as part of our strategy and campaigning. That's why we say we know some seats we're gonna be able to take them, because we can tell you that these other people don't even live, either they don't live in the constituency or they don't live in the country, but they hold public office. So we know this. <clears throat> So the fact that we have failed to put through reforms over the last four years to lead this, to lead to, has led to where we are now <clears throat> and the challenges that we have now. So the only thing that we can do is galvanize numbers, people coming out and registered to vote. We have to change the message from a message of polarization and, and loss of hope to a message of real saying, no, 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 we can still uh, create uh, the, um, the change that we want but we need the citizens to come behind and register to vote and show up and protect their vote. They have to come out there. We need the citizens to really galvanize. If the numbers are big, the machine will lose. But right now, uh, we need to focus on getting people registered to vote. So, and then the lesson learned is, we go past 2023, we want to put in strong reforms and really cause uh, real change inside, our, inside our, our parliamentary systems and our legislative systems. But that conversation is, is a deep one because we can even take that back to the GNU, uh, where seats and deals were made on Zach that have led Zach to where it is now, including opposition. They really failed to, put, to get control of this thing. And of course, they lost 2013. And, and here we are with the problems that we have in what's considered free and fair elections. I, I have to ask you this one, because it's, you, you talked about, you know, you know the seats that you're going to take. How uh, <laughs> many seats do you think you're going to get this coming election? Oh, I can't answer that. Um, I don't know, uh, to be honest with you, because uh, we're still uh, fielding candidates. We have uh, our process and where we want to go. Uh, I can't answer that one because the, the, the numbers and data will help us get there as we get close to the election. You, you, you can ask me again as we get close to the election. I'll probably have a better answer. Uh, but there's a target we want to hit uh, that we think we can make an impact, uh, both where we're showing uh, results on the ground and then we're also focused in parliament where we're going to uh, push, uh, push the agenda that we want for in preparation for 2028. Uh, but in, in this side here, I can't tell you that um, at the point we are right now, because we still have to, uh, the, the, uh, the party and the people, so we have to decide who's, who's going to represent them as we uh, prepare for Congress. <laughs> you should just keep, keep coming. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and I'm opening myself up to more questions. I need to just uh, keep my... You, you just talked about the Congress and yes. people electing. And so it's the issue of electing candidates. Uh, yeah. 
is a big one. So it is. When are you having your Congress? Uh, we don't have a date yet. There is an advisory that's working on that. There's some things we need to have in, in order uh, in preparation for that as well. But uh, there is an advisory that is making that decision. Again, I'm thankful that I don't make those decisions on my own. Uh, but there is a team that's putting that in place uh, as we speak. Uh, but um, we have a constitution, and it clearly outlines um, how we move forward. So we intend to follow our constitution. As I believe in, in institutional organizations, the, the institution has to be greater than the individuals in it. And that's the only way they, they can sustain, uh, whether it's um, polarization, corruption, cronyism, nep nepotism. The institution has to be very strong, and ours outlines that very clearly. So uh, it is coming. Uh, it, will be, it will be there. It will be present. Yeah. Okay, on, on that uh, Congress note, that we'll be <laughs> looking forward to. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Uh, that was uh, Robert Chapman, uh, the, uh, the presidential candidate for Democratic Union of Zimbabwe. It's, it's getting interesting in the presidential field. And of course, in the 2023 elections, because clearly um, the the heat is on and, and, and the, the work has already started and we're just waiting for, for the dates of the elections but the preparations are already happening and people are already on the ground uh, campaigning and um, it is up to you to take part as well by making sure that you are registered as, as a voter and if you don't register to vote then don't blame other people because mm -hmm. you, you have a role to play so let's meet again tomorrow when we talk about other issues my name is Zenzel Ndewele have a good day.